Good morning, everybody. Yeah, good morning. So thank you for attending our presentation. So I'm Milan, and with my colleague Quentin, we will present you the Secure Boot. Um, a short presentation. So we are embedded Linux engineer at Bootlin, uh, formerly uh, Free Electrons, but uh, due to some uh, trademark uh, dispute, we change our company name, but that's it. We just change the company name. We are still the same engineer, the same team, and still the, we have a strong open source uh, focus. Um, for a customer, we implemented a full chain of trust on a custom IMX6 board, and we wanted to share it uh, in case uh, it can help uh, other people. So. Uh, this is uh, what we are going to talk uh, in this presentation. A short disclaimer, uh, we are definitely not uh, security experts, and we are presenting you uh, one way to verify both uh, on a board based on a specific family of SOCs, but um, some parts uh, can be applied to other boards and uh, Quentin will tell you when there is some uh, specificity on uh, IMX SOC. So first, uh, an introduction. Um, who wants to verify the boot sequence and why? Um, so there is product vendors. Uh, they want to make sure that uh, the device are used in the same way they should be and not for a different purpose. Uh, also, uh, not for running inappropriate software. So, for example, uh, a company may have um, some uh, software uh, limitation and uh, would need a license uh, for a customer to have a fully uh, featured software. So, this is, uh, it can be used uh, with uh, the chain of trust to be sure that the user are using the um, the fully featured software with a license, and of course to protect customers um, uh, without having some uh, malware uh, on your system. There is also end users. Uh, they may want to make sure that uh, the system has not been tampered with. So basically, it's to make sure that the binaries uh, you are trying to load, uh, boot, or execute uh, were built by a person uh, that you trust. So how does it work? Everything is based on digital signature verification, which is different from encryption. So Quentin will uh, show you in the next slides the difference between uh, signature verification and encryption. Um, so in fact, the first element in the boot process uh, authenticates the second one, the second one will authenticate the third one, et cetera, et cetera. And that's why it's called a chain uh, of trust because you have this chain mechanism. Um, and if any element is authenticate, authenticated but uh, not sufficiently locked down, so for example, if you let uh, console access in bootloader or root access in a user space, uh, the device is not verified anymore and so you will break the chain of trust. So uh, this is how uh, the chain of trust look like. So you have the ROM code. It has a public key. Uh, it uses this public key to perform a signature verification on the bootloader. Then the bootloader has a, a public key and it will perform uh, signature verification on the kernel, and the kernel will have a digest to uh, perform a hash uh, verification on the root file system. So every component is verified using its uh, digital uh, signature and a public key. Uh, the root file system integrity is verified using a hash mechanism. We we'll see uh, later in next slides how it works. And our experience, uh, so as I said before, we implemented it uh, on a custom IMX6 uh, board. Uh, Content work on uh, the chain of trust from uh, room code to the kernel, and I worked on the root file system parts. 
Okay, so um, now a little bit, a little bit of uh, well uh, explanation on what are the differences between encryption and signature. So as Milan told you, uh, the verified boot sequence or a secure boot, uh, as, it call, as it's called, is based on signature and not encryption. These are uh, different things, but they are compatible. You can actually have encrypted data that, that is also signed. So here is the monetary Alice and Bob example about encryption. So the point of encryption is to uh, well be able to send some data that is unreadable for anyone else um, that isn't supposed to receive, for example, the mail. So here we want to be sure that the mail Alice is sending to Bob uh, well, it can only be read, read, uh, by, read by Bob. So you have as input the data and the public key of Bob, which uh, is the input to a math function. So we don't care what is it, but it's a math function. And then it outputs the encrypted data. You send it over the internet. Nobody can read it except Bob. Bob receives the encrypted data, and it put it into a math function along with the, its uh, his public, uh, private key, sorry, which is um, the only one to own. Of course, it's his private key. Into your math function, and then you have the decrypted data. And you're sure Bob is the only one who is able to read this data. The next one is actually the signature uh, verification. So here is a different purpose. Here you want to be sure that Alice, so the one who sent the mail to Bob is actually Alice, and not somebody else. The data is unencrypted, so everybody can read it. Um, so basically, Alice will take her private key and her data, put it into a math function, it will output a signed data. It's readable by anyone. It's a very important uh, concept. Everybody can read it. And go through the internet, and Bob receives it, you can read it, and to attest that Alice is the one who sent the mail, uh, well, we'll use the public key of Alice to actually uh, verify the signature. It goes into a math function again, a different one, and well, the data is verified or not. So you can attest it's actually Alice who has sent the mail. So that's it for the differences between encryption and signature. So now you have to know that, well, the secure boot sequence, it's, it has consequences, of course. Uh, it's costly in terms of, well, putting it, setting up the whole architecture for uh, managing your keys, creating your keys, signing all your binaries, etc. So, of, cor of course, it's a bit longer to uh, handle all these cases, those cases. You have some added complexity to your workflow for developers. Because, well, once your platform is locked down and can only boot uh, verified uh, binaries, you have to sign those uh, binaries to test them. And, of course, the boot time is, well, increased because, well, you have a, a bunch of authentication along the way to the uh, prompt boot, uh, to the Linux prompt, sorry. And, well, last but not least, you really have to be careful with your private keys because if one gets stolen or leaked, then, well, you're pretty much screwed up because, well, anyone can sign your, uh, your binaries and then it's not secure anymore. So that was it for the introduction, and now we can go to the first element of the chain of trust, the ROM code, or, the, or as it's called, the root of trust. So this is the, really the main point of your chain of trust. Um, it's very specific to the SOC, so it depends on your vendors. Not all SOCs support uh, secure booting. And, well, as I told you before, you need the public key uh, to be able to verify the signature of binary. So you need a way to securely store it somewhere that the ROM code can look at. And, well, that depends on every vendor uh, implementation. And it's definitely embedded in the ROM code, so you don't have access to it. You have to trust your vendor. And there are definitely different vendors that uh, implement some kind of uh, secure boot. So these are the main one, I would say, Xilinx, Tegra, Atmel, and XP, et cetera. I'm missing some, surely. Um, so now you have to have a way to store your public keys. Uh, so this is very the, the specific um, way 
for an XP to handle the public keys. So um, basically, it's a non-volatile memory, of course, because you need it to be uh, up when the bootstrap starts. Uh, NXP uses OTP, so one-time programmable fuses. So basically, a fuse, uh, if fuse also, is well, we could um, illustrate it with a wire, and when the current pass through the wire, then it's a binary one, and you apply a very, very, very high current to it, and it disrupts uh, the wire, and then you can get a binary zero. And that's how it works. And it's uh, re irreversible. So once you have blow a fuse, a fuse, then well, never gets a word again. Um, OTP fuses are really, really expensive in terms of size occupied on your PCB. And whereas the public is already at least one kilobyte, and sometimes uh, up to four kilobytes. So maybe a good idea would be to actually store the hash of this key which is way, way smaller, into, well, the OTP, and have the public key in another place. For example, in the binary you're going to load. That way, you just have to check the hash of the public key that is embedded somewhere else, and if it matches, then you're good to go. Well, now we have plenty of space, so why not using maybe four keys so that we can actually revoke some if some get stolen or, well, uh, lost. So that way you can just revoke one key and just say, well, this one, we don't want to use it anymore. We can use uh, any of the three remaining one. So that's it. Um, for the next slide, yeah, thank you. Uh, the ROM code, so basically the process is to load the bootloader in your secure uh, space to avoid physical, physical attacks. So the point is here, uh, if you load your bootloader and authenticate it from a space that isn't secure, the problem is once you have to actually boot, execute the binary, well, this is a time frame where an attacker can actually change the binary and uh, make it like it was authenticated while it was definitely not. Um, you, then it loads the embedded public key. Which, was in, which is in the U boot bootloader binary, for example. Uh, it checks the hash of the public key, which is embedded in the binary of the bootloader against the one which is in the hash table of, uh, made of different OTPs, fuses. You check the public key, then you execute the bootloader binary if it matches. And on NXP for IMX, etc. SOC family, it's called HAB for High Insurance Boot. Um, so how do you set it up for your board? It's, again, very specific to your vendor. Here, uh, you use code signing tools, so CST, uh, for creating the keys, so the private, uh, private keys and certificates. You flash the fuses using uh, working and verified U-Boot. Uh, again, using an XP specific code, which is fuse flash or something like that, fuse prog, I think. Uh, with the fuse table returned by CST, you sign the bootloader using, again, CST, and you check the status of the bootloader, HIB underscore status, from the bootloader, from, so from U-boot, with a signed U-boot, which is also an XP specific. And if you have reached this step uh, successfully, then you can decide to lock down your bootloader to actually uh, restrict the loading of the bootloader to one which is authenticated, so verified. And, well, if you just screwed one of the previous item and you, you, you blow the locking fuse, then you screwed up, so be sure you're doing the right thing. Uh, so this is the two examples of uh, the results of HAB status from uh, U-Boot. The first example, uh, you have the first line which is secure boot disabled. This is because I haven't blown actually the locking fuse. When it's blown, then it's secure boot enabled. If you have any HAB event following this line, it means that your bootloader hasn't been authenticated. So it failed. Uh, in the next uh, example, you can see no HAB events found. Well, you successfully authenticated your bootloader. So that was it for the ROM code part to authenticate the, well, the bootloader. But now you have to authenticate your kernel. Um, so 
trust no one. Believe me, trust no one. So there's no point of having a secure bootloader if it's not authenticated by the ROM code. So by that, I mean, if you can actually switch the bootloader with something that isn't authenticated, then there's no point actually uh, taking the time to authenticate it. Because, well, with a not, not authenticated bootloader, you can boot whatever you want after that. Uh, the bootloader has to be sufficiently locked down. So it depends on the bootloader binary you're booting. And this is, there is a very specific use case, for, um, well, example for uh, U-boot in mainline. U-boot in mainline has an environment variable called verify. If it's set to no, U-boot stops to verify the signature of images. And that's, well, not what, what we want. So we definitely do not want any user to access the console to set the environment variable from there. So you have to disable the console at all. Um, well, very important point, point. You should, under no circumstances, trust anything that isn't in an authenticated binary. So that means that, well, environments are often on other mediums. But there, you can trust them because you cannot authenticate them. So you should use the one which is definitely in the U-boot binary that was authenticated by the ROM code. Uh, well, that doesn't really work with uh, update uh, software from Linux kernel because they always, they often uh, interact with the U-boot uh, environments to say you should uh, boot this image or this image. So I have a pending patch for U-boot to only load a handful of variables that you can control. Uh, from the U-boot um, embedded uh, environment binary, and it can load from whichever medium you want to load the environment from. So, yeah, that's it. Um, so now, how it actually works, you're gonna use the device tree blob, which is basically the same as uh, it's in the kernel. It's used to actually embed the, the, the public key within the U-boot binary. And this public key will be used to check the signature of the kernel images. And because it's appended to the U-boot binary, it's also authenticated by the ROM code. So you can actually trust the public key which is within, uh, well, the U-boot binary. Um, so now to be a bit more practical and, well, simple to use, um, to check the signature of the different images, you have two choices. Either you load one image and then its signature, and then the second image and its signature, etc., or you use the fit image, which is basically a container uh, storing a lot of uh, different binaries and their hashes. And MK image, so the tool to actually compile the fit image, has already built in support for signing and well, doing the, the binaries hash. So well, well, knock. So better use this tool. So, uh, well, now in the process to get you to the next uh, chain, uh, in a chain of trust, you have to create actually your keys to verify the kernel uh, signature, to actually sign the bootloader, the, sorry, to sign the kernel and verify it from the bootloader. So uh, the first line is to create an RSA 4K uh, key, which is called my underscore key. This is a private key. And then you create a certificate. Certificate is really close to a uh, public key. Um, so it's really, uh, MK image requires the use of uh, certificates and not public keys. Well, it's a choice. And it's really, really important that your certificate and your private key are named the same. Otherwise, MK image doesn't work at all. Um, so this is an example of a source, uh, source file for the well, the device tree used to embed the, the public key within the U-boot binary. So you have the signature uh, device tree node. Uh, if your board already has a device tree, well, you should be able to use it and just add the signature device tree node. Uh, something to note is that key name hint and the suffix to key dash DT node has to be the same um, value or name as the one you have given to your key. So in the previous slide, it was my underscore key. You have to, uh, well, use the same. 
There is uh, also a property which is called required. It's, it's, it's either uh, image or configuration. It depends on which level you want to actually do your uh, signature verification. And you can find uh, well, the explanation in the documentation here in the Ubud project. Uh, so what's a fit image? As I say, it's basically a container. So you have a set of images, different one, one, two, three, kernel, whatever. Uh, the same for device trees, in ITROMFS, you have also support for other kind of files like scripts. And then you have also configurations. So configurations are a way to force the user to uh, load binaries together. So for example, here you have conf at one, so the, the red box, which forces the user to load the first kernel, the third device tree, and the first in ITROMFS. Uh, so that's a way to force your, uh, your user to boot a certain configuration, a certain configuration. It supports different architectures, OSCs, uh, image types, and a lot of other things. And you can find all of them in the source code in command slash image.c. Uh, so this is really a quick example of a source file for fit image. Uh, so we have the image, uh, images, device tree, well, node with all the, the different binaries where you can find them, where you can load uh, your um, binaries, which key to use to sign each of uh, the binaries, and you have the configurations on the, on the, le on the right. And there is an important uh, line, which is default equals conf at one. And this will be important in the next upcoming slides. And you can see that the conf at one has kernel is equal to kernel at one, so it will be using the first kernel and the device reads, which is also the first one. So uh, there is a little bit of tricks to do before uh, compiling your Ubud binary. You have to actually uh, compile your um, device tree, which contains the embedded public key outside of uh, your Ubud well, source uh, repository. And this is because we need to use uh, mkimage, which is a tool from uBoot, to actually embed the public key before we are going to build the uBoot binary. So you use DTC to uh, do, well, the first compilation of the uBoot public key, the uh, DTB. Then you compile all the tools from uBoot. You run mkimage to actually build the fit image, and at the same time, embed the public key within the device tree. And then you compile your Ubud binary using the external uh, device tree blob, which is called Ubud underscore public key. Uh, these, are, these are the, well, the configuration you have to put to enable uh, the fit, uh, fit image signature verification on uh, in Ubud. The say, uh, config OF control is for uh, embedding actually, using actually the uh, device tree bulb support uh, in Ubud, and the first two items are NXP specific. Um, so, this is actually what uh, it looks like to boot a fit image with all the verification steps, etc. So, provided you have a fit image loaded at Xerox 15, let's say, so you do boot M Xerox 15 pound uh, conf at one. But since the default in the configurations uh, node in the source file of your fit image, you know that conf at one is the default one. So you can actually just skip the, the part after the pound. So boot M Xorix 15 is fine. You can see that it's uh, using conf at one. It's trying to load the kernel at one. It does all of those things and verify the hash integrity, which says, well, it's OK. So let's get uh, to the next uh, binary in the, in the fit image, which is the device tree bulb. It checks it. Well, it's fine. So let's get started with the kernel. But then, well, someone touched the device tree bulb. And well, hopefully, it will get it and stops the boot. And that's what happened in the lower part of the, this slide. It's verifying the hash integrity. They say, no, I, I cannot verify it. So, well, I'm stopping there, and I'm crashing you, but you shouldn't stop. Stop here. So 
I think that was it for the part uh, up to the root file system. So now Milen will uh, present her part on the root file system. Yeah, so it's uh, the final part of the chain of trust. Um, to have a verified root file system, we have chosen the following solution. Uh, it's, uh, you can have other kind of solution, but this is what we uh, choose. So first of all, we, have, we wanted to have an unalterable file system. So we choose to have a read-only file system. Uh, so it's impossible to modify it. Uh, so we use a SquashFS uh, image, which is a type for read-only file system. Um, so this part is not really part of the uh, secure boot process, uh, but it was important for us and for our customer. So the authentication of the root file system, so it's uh, really the uh, part of the chain of trust, we use DM Verity. So DM Verity, it's an infrastructure to check if the root file system is the one we are expecting to have. So in fact, it's the authentication of the SquashFS image. And then Verity needs some uh, user space application to authenticate uh, the system. And so you need to have uh, these uh, tools available. Uh, so that's why we choose to, ha to have uh, init1fs as a first file system. And in this uh, init1fs, you will have the uh, application tools uh, to perform the uh, authentic authentication of the root file system. Um, the init1fs is built in in the kernel, so uh, thanks to that, it doesn't uh, break the uh, chain of trust uh, because, uh, as Quentin told you before, uh, the kernel is already uh, in the chain of trust uh, using the fit image. So now, DM VBT. So DM, uh, it stands for uh, device mapper. It's an infrastructure in the Linux kernel to create virtual layers on block devices. Uh, so device mapper Verity, uh, it provides integrity checking uh, of block devices using kernel crypto API. DM Verity could hash the whole block device and then compare the uh, hash with an expected hash, but it's not doing that. Otherwise, the boot time will be very, very long. So instead of that, it's used a cryptographic hash tree. And your block device will be split in small blocks. And each block will uh, have its hash. And it will create a hash tree until the last hash, which is called root hash. We will use this root hash in uh, the authentication mechanism. So we will see it in the next slides. And th these blocks are uh, hashed only on access. So instead of having a longer boot time, uh, we will just have a smaller uh, long uh, access on a block device. And as I said before, the Verity needs some uh, user space application. Um, so crypt setup uh, package provides different tools, uh, such as Verity setup. So we see in next slide, Verity setup is a tool to uh, create the uh, hash tree and also to authenticate the device. So DM Verity in our case, um, so we have our kernel. Um, DM Verity uh, has some uh, configuration in the kernel, so you need to enable this configuration to have DM, DM Verity. And as I said before, we have a need from FS, and we created an init script that will use a Verity setup tool to uh, perform the verification on our block device. Uh, for our use case, we use UBI block device, but it can be uh, other kind of uh, block device. If the verification is uh, successful, then you can use uh, mount uh, command, for example, to have access uh, of your SquashFS that you verified. And if it's not the case, then it will uh, fail to uh, mount the SquashFS, and it will uh, stop the init here. 
So now let's see how to create the hash tree that we have seen in previous uh, slide. So um, Verity Setup can uh, create the hash tree on device or images. Uh, for in this example, it's on images, but you can do it on device node. So we have our SquashFS image. We uh, perform Verity Setup format command. Uh, the resulting uh, image is a hash image, and it's uh, containing the hash tree that we will use to uh, authenticate the device. And it also prints uh, on your screen the root hash. And we will, uh, you need to keep it uh, because we will use it to authenticate the device to be sure that the uh, SquashFS image that we uh, create the hash tree right now it's the correct one uh, that we want to authenticate. So by default, uh, the DM Verity and Verity Setup uh, expect to have a block device with data in there and another block device with uh, the hash tree. So the command used uh, is Verity Setup format, then the data device and the hash device. But in fact, in our use case, we wanted to have only one device. So our block device will have uh, the SquashFS image and also uh, it will contain the uh, hash tree. For that, we concatenate the hash image at the end of the uh, SquashFS uh, image to have at the end a uh, final SquashFS containing also the hash tree. Um, to do that, Verity Setup uh, tool uh, have, uh, has an option, uh, hash offset, uh, and to, to say how to, uh, to locate uh, the hash area in the same device or image. So here is the, uh, the example of the command. So Verity Setup format, then we set uh, the offset, so where we can find the hash tree in the same uh, device or image. Uh, currently, in our example, uh, because the hash uh, tree is at the end of the SquashFS image, the offset is the size of the SquashFS image. And then the data device, so in our use case, it's the SquashFS image, and the final uh, resulting result, so it's the SquashFS image and also the uh, hash uh, image. So now we have created our uh, hash tree. We have the uh, root hash, and we will see how to uh, authenticate the device. So now we are on our platform. We have flashed flash, uh, all the different images. And we, are, we have a block device uh, that contains the SquashFS and the hash uh, image. We use Verity Setup create command that will need the offset to know where to find the uh, hash tree and also the root hash. If the hash corresponds to the one that is uh, available in the hash tree, then you have a mapper device on uh, the SquashFS verified. So at the end, you will have a slash dev, slash mapper, slash something. And on this device mapper, you can uh, use the standard mount uh, command to then have access to your verified SquashFS. So the command used is uh, very tight, very Verity setup create, uh, then the name of the device mapper. So in our example, it's a root file system. It can be uh, another one. We, again, we use the hash offset uh, option of uh, Verity setup to say where to locate uh, the, uh, the hash tree in the device, device block. Then there is the data device and the hash device. Uh, in our use case, it's the same one. And finally, the uh, root hash. So because we use the same block device uh, and it contains uh, both data and uh, hash uh, image, we use UBI block zero uh, twice. Of course, if you use the default uh, mechanism, so if you have uh, 
for example, uh, the data on UBI block zero and the uh, hash tree on UBI block one, then you don't use hash offset uh, parameters and you will have uh, block zero and block one in your uh, command verity setup create. Yeah, so here you can see that we have uh, the offset and the hash uh, parameters and we need a way to uh, have it available uh, in the kernel. So in fact, we use uh, both args. Uh, and for that, we created a U-boot environment script. But this new comp component can be attacked. So to not, again, break the chain of trust, we add it in the fit image. So in the fit image, we have the U-boot environment script uh, with the uh, hash, uh, with which, which has the signature of the hash of the binary. Then you would check the signature of this uh, U-boot environment script. Uh, if the signature is uh, matching, then uh, you can source this script. And in this script, we have some uh, variables to, uh, to retrieve the offset and the hash. And also, of course, it sets the boot hacks. Uh, thanks to that, we can retrieve it in the kernel. So here it's the final uh, mechanism. So as I said before, we have uBoot. It checks the signature of uh, the uBoot environment script. If it's not uh, the correct one, it will fail to source it. If it's the correct one, it will source the script. Thanks to that, in the boot args, we will have the offset and the hash. Then we have our kernel with the MVT enabled, our init1fs with the init script that will use the verity setup command to do the verification on the UBI block device. Of course, as we have seen before, verity setup uh, command needs the hash and the offset. So thanks to the boot args, you can retrieve it. And if the verification is successful, then you have a device mapper and you can uh, do uh, switch route. So in our use case, uh, we use switch route instead of mount because we wanted to have um, to switch the root file system from the init RAMFS to the uh, verified squashFS. Otherwise, uh, our system will always be on the init RAMFS, and we didn't want that. And to complete the um, chain of trust, so if as we added a new component, so the U-boot environment script, for example, we add it in the fit image to not break the chain of trust. Uh, thanks, Milan. Uh, so <laughs> now we have actually, well, completed our chain of trust. Um, so uh, basically, now to summarize what has been done yet until now, um, so into the, in the ROM code, you have up to four um, hash of public keys, uh, which are used to verify the public key which is embedded in the binary of the bootloader. Uh, then when it's verified, the public key, then you can use it to verify actually the signature of the bootloader. Once that's done, you have another public key in the uh, U-boot binary, which is used to uh, verify the signature of the kernel and the DTB, well, basically the fit image, the whole fit image with the U-boot script uh, Milan uh, presented just the slides before. And once that's done, you have the digest within uh, the fit image, which is used to verify and authenticate the rootFS. So, yeah, basically that's done. Um, but now we really want uh, some kind of, I would say, distribution uh, as a rootFS. And we don't want to, well, do it manually. We can use build root, Yocto, whatever build system you want. But in our case, it was Yocto. But Yocto has a really specific uh, way to handle, to create bit image, uh, fit images. And currently, uh, it's the kernel recipe that actually inherits uh, the kernel fit image class. And that means that, well, it's done after uh, the rootFS, uh, sorry, before the rootFS has been created. And I think the point is that actually people want to have the fit image, the kernel, whatever, within the slash boot of the rootFS. But our script needs the rootFS 
uh, to be actually compiled, built, so that we can uh, uh, compute the hash and put it in the U-boot script. But, well, we want it in the fit image, which is created before the root of s. So basically, that's how you end up with a dependency loop in Yocto, and that's really hard to debug. So well, we throw away the kernel fit image class and wrote a new image and class uh, recipes to work around this issue. It's really, I would say, the level of uh, draft or proof of concept. But that works, so that was it for us. Uh, so, well, it was a very specific example we uh, presented today to have only a uh, read-only uh, read file system. But, well, you definitely may want to have some read-write file system uh, besides your uh, read-only file system. So if it stores not critical data, well, just mount it uh, uh, just well, alongside your uh, read-only file system. That's fine. You can store logs, use data. Well, you don't care. But if it's, if it's critical, well, we haven't really looked at it, but a hint would be to look at uh, IMA EVM. We have provided a bit of uh, well toolings to look at it. I don't know how it works. Just have a look at it. <laughs> uh, so to well end this talk, remember I told you to trust no one. Well, you cannot even trust the the, the vendor of your SOC. Uh, so NXP had publicly disclosed about a year ago that they had secure boot vulnerabilities in, our, in their HAB uh, verification code for IMX6 and the other family SOCs. But I think right now it should be fixed, so you should ask them if you want to base your product on it. And I attended, well, yesterday uh, uh, a good talk on introduction to reverse engineering by Michael Anderson. Uh, and it was really interesting because, well, nothing is 100% uh, secure. So what do you want to protect yourself from? Uh, so well, I'll, I'll end it with this. Look at him, uh, Tim, uh, sorry, his talk to, well, see what can be done to actually break your thing. So that was it. Thank you for your attention. If you have any question, I'll be in the audience to pursue the microphone. Yeah, thank you. Hello. Hello. Okay. How long did it take your team to implement all this? Uh, so actually, from the beginning to actually uh, look at all the software, everything, I would say, for both of us, it took like uh, six months, but not full time. So yeah. I would say month is definitely. Um, two questions. One of all, I saw that you're using SHA-1. You probably shouldn't use that as a hash algorithm anymore. Um, just, just it, it's, it's totally broken. Um, number two, where is your code that you actually talked about that works for doing the switch root thing so you don't get the dependency problem? Well, it's a bit different. Um, um, the problem with the dependency loop is within Yocto. It, does not have something to do with the final root of s. So it's only when you actually build uh, the root of s there is the problem. So, well, it's a new well recipe, so that's how Yocto work. So the question is, is the recipe in Yocto yet? Uh, no, it's, well, in our Yocto, yeah. <laughs> yeah, mm, no, but well, definitely would want to work on it. So I have two, two questions too. Uh, firstly, how many boards do you actually break doing this? And secondly, uh, is it emulatable in something like QMU? Ah, so good question. Uh, the first one, have, how many boards have we broken yet? So none. <laughs> um, yeah, there are a lot of tutorials on the internet. So luckily, we didn't have to break any boards. So. 
we're happy with this. Um, and the next question was, uh, oh, QMU's uh, support. I haven't, I, yeah, I don't know. Sorry. Uh, you mentioned the performance impact uh, of the verification. Uh, did you actually measure how uh, how much it affected the boot time in your case? Uh, so uh, I think there's not really a point measuring it because if you need a secure device, well, the latency you don't care really. Um, on the rootfs part. They pretend that the I/O takes so much time compared to the hash computation that, well, you can ignore it. Any reason uh, you do verifi verification of your rootfs in kernel and not uBoot? So, for example, can uBoot read uh, this block device? Uh, so the question is where the Verification of the rootfs is. Why not in your boot? There is no support for squashfs first, and second is that. Oh, uh, oh that was it. Um, it's on two different mediums for our, uh, media for our clients. So the first one is used to store the kernel, uh, etc., and the rootfs is on another medium. So uh, there is a really interesting remarks, and I forgot about this. Um, it's actually done only on the read access of your data. So you cannot actually use the bootloader to verify your uh, rootfs, because it's done only when you access data, which is done only by the kernel. Yep. You have four public keys stored in your, in your boot image. How do you revoke one if one's bad? Uh, the same way you actually flash the public key, so you blow a fuse. And this fuse just say, well, this one is revoked. That's it. Oh, uh, from, from U-Boot. So within U-Boot, with your uh, update scripts or whatever, you ask it to re uh, well, uh, blow the fuse. But yeah, if it's already too late, then oh, you're screwed. <laughs> Anyone? Yeah. Oh, again. I actually have an observation on an earlier comment. Uh, one time verification of the squash FS is not good enough. Whilst the squash FS itself is read only, it does not cache all your data. So if you're sneaky, you can go in and rewrite the data that's in the SquashFS. Uh, we found this because one of our clients accidentally ran their upgrade system against their currently running SquashFS. This makes the kernel very unhappy um, and crashes the system. When will the URL work? I, I tried it and it, it, it returns file not found. The URL on up there, I tried it. Yeah, it's not up yet. Uh, but it's on the sked.org uh, website. So it's going to be available uh, hopefully next week. Tops. OK. Any other question? Well, thank you. Thanks. And bon appetit. <laughs>